Turn around and grab your Bible. Just grab your Bible. Just hang loose for a second. I don't know what the Lord's doing here. Just hang loose, okay? That doesn't mean we'll use you. Just hang loose for a second, all right? Take your Bibles and turn with me to Matthew chapter 15, verses 21 through 28. I want to read two verses to you. Two verses. I'm actually going to probably ultimately end up reading all of these verses, but I just want to read two verses to begin with to establish, to establish some direction for us today. I want you to see this. I feel the Lord working here, so hang with me upstairs for this change. Verse 21 says, Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. Leaving that place of ministry, Jesus withdrew. Leaving that place of ministry, Jesus withdrew. Leaving that place that he was ministering in, he goes to another place that happens to be out of his way. But yet Jesus is on the way. There is a reason why Jesus would go out of his way. Everybody say that kind of love. That kind of love. Verse 22, it says, A Canaanite woman from the vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon possessed and suffering terribly. Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. Here is a Canaanite woman. Here's Jesus going out of his way. Here is a woman who's crying out to Jesus. Here is a woman who's in need of a miracle. Here is the miracle coming. It's on the way. The miracle, it's on the way. The, that kind of love. Somebody look at your neighbor and announce to them the subject matter of our conversation. That kind of love that kind of love how many of you came today to chase after jesus how many of you came? somebody give him praise with the voice that he gave you to praise him come on somebody rise up and praise him in this place hang on a second you see a week ago we all sat around the tv praising an event called the super bowl watching crazy commercials, a halftime show with Lady Gaga flying with a chicken wing in your hand, pizza in your mouth. You were praising the Super Bowl. Today, I want you to have some super praise, not for an event, but for a person. The person in the name of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We may not be serving chicken wings, but the Bible says there's healing in his wings. He is Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals. He was wounded for our transgression bruised for our iniquities listen the chastisement of our peace is upon him by his stripes we are healed good God Almighty healing is on the way healing is on the way your healing is on the way I don't know what the Lord is trying to do in this word but your healing is on the way you see maybe you feel like the enemy has stacked the odds against you. He's run up the score. You feel like the place that you're in is far from the grace of God, but your healing is on the way. Your finances may be desperate. Your emotions may be in despair. Your, your marriage may be in ruins, but God wants to display his healing, and he does not display his healing through an event. God displays his healing through an experience, and the experience that God uses to display his healing is the experience called love. Good God Almighty. Is it all right if I preach a little and teach a little today? In fact, I'll probably teach a little more so that I can set up my preach. Look at your neighbor and announce to them this brand new series, the title of this series, Love Handles. If your spouse is beside of you, say, I love your love handles. If your spouse is not beside of you, and you're looking for a spouse, I would recommend you not saying that. <laughs> just, just be seated. Thank you, guys. Just be seated. Somebody turn on the AC for me, please. Some of you are like, oh, it's cold. No, turn on the AC for me, please. I feel the Lord at work here today. I want to take you to a narrative of scripture in Matthew chapter 15, but I'm not going to begin there. I'm going to digress a little. I'm going to begin in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1. 
because Paul writes this passage of Scripture, and we'll use it as the context for our conversation. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Paul writes this passage of Scripture. In fact, you've probably heard this passage of Scripture if you've gone to a wedding before. The wedding, maybe you've heard this quoted. It's called the love chapter. It, ca it captures the characteristics of love. But this passage of Scripture is so much deeper than just being read at a wedding. Now, however, it certainly works for that because this is a passage of scripture that should evolve in your marriage. This is a passage of scripture that Kim and I have posted on our wall at home, but yet it's much deeper than that. But in order for you to understand the depths of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, you really need to understand the context that it was written in. You see, Paul wrote this passage of scripture to the church at Corinth, and the church at Corinth had this group of super spiritual people in it. And they were trying to run the show. And their faith was connected to the evidence of God's existence based upon whether or not the gifts of the Spirit were present. They could establish God's existence if they saw the miraculous or saw the gifts of the Spirit. They had become super spiritual, if you will, and were beginning to change the gospel. And so Paul was upset with their tactics and certainly he was not impressed by their super spiritual qualities because he wrote this passage of scripture trying to get the early church back to the essence of God's word back to the essence of the gospel and the essence of the gospel was love centered so he writes this passage to show them something is it okay if I read a little and talk a little is that okay if I read some and then talk some Here's what verse 1, chapter 13 says. Paul writes, If I speak in the tongue of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm a resounding gong and a clanging cymbal. Let me just stop and talk about that. You see, Paul gives this beautiful illustration that would certainly stick to the minds of the people in the Corinthian city because all over Corinth there were these pagan worshipers who worshiped in a certain way they used this gong like apparatus we might call them symbols and all over Corinth these pagan worshipers who worshiped false gods would begin to bang these symbols all at all times of the day morning noon and night 24 hours a day in different venues these symbols would be crashing together I was gonna use some symbols today but they cost two hundred eighteen dollars so I didn't want to but this loud incessant noise that was continuous that was aggravating and agitating like fingernails on the chalkboard. You couldn't go anywhere in Corinth without hearing this sound morning, noon, and night. And the reason why they used this is because they thought the louder that they were, it would bring spiritual ecstasy. He said, if I speak in the tongue of men and of angels but have not love, I am nothing but a resounding gong and a clanging cymbal. But then he uses this term in verse 1 that identifies the nature of a person who talks all of the time who is a non-stop talker they incessantly talk they just continuously talk do you know of anybody who just talks all the time all they do is talk 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 if you know somebody like that raise your hand all they do is talk 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 and what is coming out of their mouths is not words it is noise This is a brilliant illustration because what Paul is saying is th these people in the church are saying all of this stuff, but their lives are not matching what they're saying. If I speak in the tongue of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm a resounding gong. All they can think about is that noise that they hate so much that they hear all of the time and a clanging cymbal. He's saying your life doesn't necessarily match what you're saying. You're super spiritual so holy but what he's saying is you've got to have a love that graduates 
let me explain that. You've got to have a love that graduates, that takes the knowledge that you have of God and turns it into action. You've got to have a love that graduates, that takes the knowledge of God and turns it into selflessness. But he's saying to the early church, if I speak in the tongue of men and of angels but have not love, I am nothing but a resounding gong and a clanging cymbal. And I begin to think about that. And he's saying that, man, sometimes the church has things out of perspective. And, 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 and sometimes we're like that because the church can become judgmental. The church can begin to operate according to its own agendas rather than the agendas of Christ. The people in the church can come in and sing, How great is our God. Oh, have you heard about Susie? She's got this problem. Oh, in the name of the Lord. It's not gossip, it's prayer. And we've become better at talking about people than we are at treating people. And we want to say things like, well, the Spirit of the Lord's not moving there because we're not doing enough of this. It's based upon our personal preference. I don't like that worship. And Paul's saying, <laughs> Paul's saying, what you're saying doesn't match how you're living. And you've become so self-absorbed with what God is doing for you that your love hasn't graduated. When was the last time that instead of you talking about what God is doing for you, you can talk about what God has done through you for others? Mm. Lord have mercy. So, so what Paul is saying, man, this is good. What Paul is saying to us is that certainly as a Christ follower, we have access to the gifts of God. But we also have a responsibility to, dis to display the love of God. And it's displaying the love of God that is most central to the heart of God. Oof. Then in verses 2 through 5, let me read this. Verses 2 through 5. He tightens up on the definition. Thank you, Carmen. You're so awesome. He said, if I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but I do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all that I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. And then in verses 4 and 5, he begins to describe some of the characteristics of love. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. Wow, that's certainly applicable. To our relationships I love God's word it's so illustrative verse 5 it says it does not dishonor others it is not self-seeking it is not easily angered it keeps no record of wrongs hmm. it says love is patient love is kind circle that word kind circle that word love is patient love is kind Wow love is patient love is kind huh the word kind is a very neat word in the Greek. What Paul is saying to us is that our love should be an agape love. An agape love is a love that pours out of us and pours on to the needs of others that is not self-centered, but is selfless, that looks around for the needs and is so focused on the needs that we're willing to do whatever we can to meet the needs. It's not like we proclaim God on Sunday, but we ignore the needs around us on Monday. You know what I'm saying? If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I'm a resounding gong and a clanging cymbal. But he uses the word kind, that kind of love. The word kind in the Greek is, 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 is so unique. It actually means this, Rodney. It means to be so focused on the needs of others that you'll do whatever it takes to bend over backwards to become all that they need you to be in order to meet their need. Wow. In other words, what Paul is saying is, do we do whatever we can to become whatever others need or do we look at others and demand them to be like us? Whew, good Lord, that, that, that'll preach. I'm going somewhere, I promise. Look at your neighbor and say he's going somewhere. Verses 6 and 7, you need to see this. 
verses 6 and 7. I'm going to get back to the narrative in a, in a minute, just mainly two verses. But 6 and 7 says, love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It always protects, it always trusts, it always hopes, it always perseveres. Verse 8, love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. For there is knowledge, it will pass away. Hmm. That's verse 8. I know I didn't give it to you. but It always protects us, verse 7. It always protects, it always trusts, it always hopes, it always perseveres. Some of your translations say that it bears all things. That word bear in the Greek is also very unique in that it, a secondary meaning of the word bear in the Greek means to handle. In other words, what Paul is saying is love handles all things. Mm. Love handles all things. And, and if we're a Christ follower, we have the responsibility of displaying the love of Christ to all of those that are around us. If I speak in the tongue of men and of angels but have not love, I'm a resounding gong and a clanging cymbal is what he says. Huh. You, you see, what Paul is trying to teach us is that there is a physical reaction to the love of God. There is a physical reaction. There is a physical reaction. Put that point up. It, 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 I don't know if I gave it to you this morning, but there is a physical reaction to the love that God gives. Think about that. There is a physical reaction to the love that God gives. Think about Christ. He did not come to serve us just in word, but also in deed. We serve a Savior who was born of a virgin named Mary, who lived a blameless life for 33 years. And he did not consider equality with heaven something to hold on to, but rather he reacted and he placed upon himself flesh. Bible says that we don't serve one who's not been tempted, but one who's been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. The Bible says that he reacted and showed us love because he said, I did not come to be served, but to serve and to offer my life a ransom for many. The Bible says that he showed us and reacted in love by showing us his generosity because the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave us his only son. He gave us his only son. He gave us his only son. The Bible says that he reacted in love and he climbed on a cross and he stretched open his arms and he took nails in his hands and feet. Then he was placed in a tomb. And on the third day, he reacted to love by showing us the resurrection so that we could display his love in everything we do. What I'm trying to say is God's love causes a physical reaction. It causes a physical reaction in your marriage, in your relationships, in your finances. God's love causes a physical reaction. Jesus didn't say, I just, I, I love you in word. He showed us in deed. Wow. Now that we understand that a little bit more, let me take you back to the narrative. Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15. Turn there with me. Matthew chapter 15. Let me read a couple of verses again to you. Matthew chapter 15. Here's something that I need you to understand. This is, there's two things I want to give you for the rest of our journey together today. Number one, write this down. All note takers are going to heaven. Remember that. Don't write that down. I'm just telling you. Write this down. Love goes out of its way to get in the way. Good Lord, that's good. Love goes out of its way to get in the way. Hmm. Hold on a second. Love, let that resonate with your spirit. Love goes out of the way to get in the way. Look at verse 21 again. It says, leaving that place, everybody say that place. Here's Jesus ministering in that place. And it says Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. I want you to understand the place where Jesus was and now the place that Jesus is going is over 80 kilometers away. It's out of the way. 80 kilometers, roughly 50 miles. He went 50 miles out of the way to a place called Tyre and Sidon for one reason. You'll read this passage of scripture. He didn't do anything else in Tyre and Sidon but meet this one woman's needs. Nothing else. He went 80 kilometers, 50 miles out of his way. Now listen, I don't want you to confuse what Jesus did going out of the way, 50 miles, not necessarily being that far out of the way because you live in the era of automobiles. 
Going 50 miles out of your way in a car doesn't seem to be too bad. But if I said, soon as we finish this service today, I want you to either get on your mule or walk to Raleigh, you all would be like, that's out of the way. <laughs> Just saying. So he goes out of his way, Angela. He goes out of his way. Why? 80 kilometers, 50 miles, 50 miles out of his way. For one reason, look at verse 22. Verse 22, a Canaanite woman, here's the plot, it thickens with the main character. A Canaanite woman from the vicinity came to Christ crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon possessed and suffering terribly. A Canaanite woman. Listen, what you need to understand is that Matthew is showing us the complexities of the life of Christ because he's giving us the geographical, the historical, and the theological significance all at the same time. You see, Tyre and Sidon are Gentile cities that are very much against Jesus and everything that he stands for, number one. Number two, it's also a Canaanite woman. A Canaanite woman is the descendant of the ancient arch enemy of Israel, the Canaanites. Here is Jesus going to a city that hates him and everything that he stands for, ministering to a woman who supposedly is, should be his enemy. He goes 50 miles out of his way for one reason, to meet this woman's needs. He's in a place that hates him. He's ministering to a woman who should be his enemy. And I begin to think about this. Hang on a second. <laughs> this is an oxymoron. <laughs> Here Jesus is in a place of hate, displaying love. Here Jesus goes out of his way 50 miles, but yet we find it hard to go out of our way. Let me refine that a little. Here's Jesus going out of his way 50 miles to minister to someone who should be his enemy, but yet we find it hard to go out of our way to establish some core principles of love in a relationship that we claim we love the other person. We all want to experience love, but, but, but not the requirements of love. We all want to experience the beauty of love, the warmth of love, but, but, but not necessarily the responsibilities of love. We all say that we love, but yet we find it easier to mistreat people than to actually love on people. We all say that we love that person, but let that person turn their back and walk in another direction. And all of a sudden, the very thing that you were using to describe them in their face, you're now turning around and complaining about them to their back. One of the characteristics that we use in love, which Paul does not describe, is complaining. <laughs> you know, sometimes we complain about the very blessings that God gave us. We say that we, we, we love the church, but we complain about what the church is not doing. We say that we love church, but, 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 but not enough to go out of our way to make sure that we're here on Sundays. Let me stop. Let me, Lord, let me stop. Let me stop. Lord, have mercy. Let me stop. I begin to think about this woman. I begin to think about Jesus going out of his way 50 miles to a place that hates him. To minister to a, a would-be enemy that's been the that's the descendant of an ancient old enemy. And God gave me an illustration. Let me let me give you the illustration that He gave to me to, to better understand what is happening here. Uh, about a week or so ago, I'm balancing mine and Kim's checking account, which I don't know if any of you ever do that, but when you do, it's not always the funnest occasion. And as I'm balancing this checkbook, I'm seeing a few debit withdrawals. Put verse 21 back up for me real quick. I need you to see something. Because I had to do this. Listen, watch. It says, leaving that place, Jesus withdrew. Everybody say withdrew. withdrew. Everybody say withdrew. withdrew. Jesus withdrew. That word stuck in my spirit. So I'm balancing 
checking account. I'm seeing some debit withdrawals that I don't quite understand. I pick up the phone and call my wife and say, hey, baby, the, uh, I'm balancing our, our checking account, and I see some stuff that I don't understand. Tell me about this, and tell me about this, and tell me about this, and tell me about this. And, 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 and right then, there's this long pause. <laughs> How many of you know if there's a pause, generally, it's probably not a good thing. And so after the long pause, she just said, it's because you love me. <laughs> she said, she said, she said, it's, it's because you, 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 you love me. I, I had to have some retail therapy to feel better. She said, I had to, I had to make a withdrawal. She said, so I had to make a withdrawal, so I went out of the way. She said, I went out of my way to make a withdrawal, so I went to the mall. <laughs> Listen, I'm not condoning the principle of retail therapy. It, it is not a biblical principle. I'm still praying for Kim. You help me with that. <laughs> However, it did make me think of a biblical principle. Here, Jesus withdrew. Jesus withdrew. Jesus withdrew. And in the withdrawing process, I, I, I think about all of the times that I see Jesus withdrawing to pray in the scripture. Jesus withdrew. Jesus withdrew. And I begin to think about when we withdraw and we tap into the love of God, we are infused with the power to love in unlovely situations. Let me say it this way. Here Jesus withdrew, and, and he was infused with power to meet the needs of a would-be enemy in a territory that hated him. And then it hit me. H hang on a second. Our ability to tap into the love of God infuses us with the power to overcome the enemy of life. Oh, Lord, have mercy. After all, didn't, didn't Paul write that love conquers all things? Didn't Peter write that we should love our brothers with a deep love because love overcomes a multitude of wrongs? Didn't Jesus say to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, that kind of love so that you can make a withdrawal? Then you'll be able to love your neighbor as yourself. That kind of love, that kind of love. But one of the reasons why we have trouble going out of our way is because we can't get self out of the way. Somebody said, Jesus. Woo. We just can't get self out of the way. You see, in order to be able to experience and display the love of Christ, you've got to be in love with the right thing. Some of you are in love with being in control. And your control freakish nature causes everyone else to hate to be around you. Bang, 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 bang. Those symbols would have been perfect right there. Some of you love to complain. You love to complain. You complain about this. You complain about that. You complain about this. You cry about that. And everybody else around you, bang, bang. That's all they hear, bang, bang. And no one wants to be around you. Some of you, you, you want love in your marriage, but not enough that you'll go out of, way, out of your way to offer forgiveness. So this woman, she ran after Jesus, and she said, Son of David, have mercy on me. Listen, what are you going to do? Are you going to hang on to what you have in your hand, or are you going to grab hold of the restoration of God? Because Paul writes, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am nothing but a resounding gong and a clanging cymbal. I don't know who this is for, but what I'm trying to tell you is that Matthew is telling us all of the great characteristics of the heart of Christ, while at the same time showing us the deficiencies of our own heart. Wow. We say that we love, we say that we love, we say that we love, but our lives don't exhibit that. We say that we're Christ followers, but yet we don't see the display of God's love. We're not reacting to God's love in our lives so that others are changed around us. We say that we love Jesus, but worship is far from us. We say that we hate the brokenness of humanity, but not enough to walk out of our way to our neighbor who is suffering in the midst of brokenness. We say things like hate the, the sin and love the sinner. Why don't we hate our own? 
own sin so that we can love everybody. Good God Almighty, Lord have mercy, I'm preaching. We talk about we want to do these things and we want to do this and experience that, but yet the love of Christ seems to be far from us. Hmm. We want to come into church and lift up our hands and worship the Lord and proclaim the goodness of God, but yet ignore the very things that are around us that requires the love of God to bring change into that environment. Don't shout me down when I'm preaching good. You see, here's the point that I'm trying to make. It is impossible to react to God's love if you have not first made the withdrawal. Because all I can think about is Moses withdrawing to the mountain so that he could spend time with God so that he could love on a bunch of stiff-necked Israelites. All I can think about is David who writes, this is the one thing that I ask and this is all that I seek, that I may make a withdrawal from the house of the Lord all the days of my life. I think about Elijah who goes up on the mountaintop so that he can experience the love of God so that he can do what God called him to do. What I'm trying to say is some of you are making withdrawals from things that are not of God. Some of you are making withdrawals from anger. Some of you are making withdrawals from bitterness. Some of you are making withdrawals from brokenness. Some of you are making withdrawals from lack. Some of you are making withdrawals from loss. And you can absolutely relate to the Canaanite woman because you feel like you're living in Tyre and Sidon, which is a long ways away from Jesus, but you have forgotten that Jesus will go out of his way to make sure that he meets your need in hopes that you will display the love of God to all of those that are around you. What you need to understand is that place that the enemy is bumping into you is only because God is trying to extract out of you the love that he placed inside of you. Good God Almighty, what I'm trying to say is great Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. That kind of love. Listen, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. That kind of love. Greater love hath no man than to lay down his life for a friend. That kind of love. God is looking for people who will go out of their way to get in the way. Good Lord, have mercy. Somebody give him praise. Be seated. <sighs> Let me read a couple more verses to you. Can I do that? Here's the thing. Number one, I told you that God wants people who will go out of their way to get in the way. Love goes out of its way to get in the way. The second thing that you need to understand is this, love heals. Love heals. Here is Jesus going 50 miles out of his way for one reason. What? 50 miles out of his way walking for one reason, a Canaanite woman, a descendant the enemy of Israel in a town that hates even the thoughts of what Jesus offers. But love heals. Jesus did not answer a word, so his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. Even the disciples haven't called on to this love yet. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him, Lord, help me. He replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. There's a lot of theological significance there. I don't have time to go into it, but verse 27, watch this. Yes, it is, Lord. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. But in verse 28, watch this. It says, then Jesus said to her, and Jesus said to her, mm, healing's on the way. I don't know who this is for in here. Listen, this is prophetic for someone because you've been making a withdrawal from all of the wrong places. He says, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. Good Lord, have mercy. Here is love showing how 
love heals. Here is Jesus, who is love, showing how love heals. He'll take our brokenness and make us whole. He'll take our mess and turn it into a message. He'll take our stress and turn it into something beautiful. He'll take our storm and grant to us a peace. It is Jesus who can do that. He'll take all of the difficulties in our lives and give us a grace that enables us to overcome what the enemy is throwing at us. And he displays all of that through his love. Mm. Mm. God, Lord, have mercy. Stand to your feet, stand to your feet, stand to your feet. I got to read you something. I didn't even give you this upstairs. Stand to your feet with your notes. I'm going to give you something today. That this, is, this is free. This is free. Mm. I want you to write this down if you're writing, if you're taking notes. Here's what I wrote down this morning. Many of us try to identify with the characteristics of Christ without the responsibility of imitating the character of Christ. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Let me give it to you again because they don't have it upstairs. Many of us try and identify or try to identify with the characteristics of Christ without the responsibility of imitating the character of Christ. Go back with me really quickly to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Where Paul writes in verse 1, he said, If I speak in the tongue of men and of angels, but have not love, I am nothing but a resounding gong and a clanging cymbal. How many of you want to be that person? No one. But then down in verse 4, he says, love is patient, love is kind, it is not rude, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not easily angered. Mm. I want you to notice something about verses 4 and following. Everywhere that it says love, you can take love out and place Jesus. Jesus is patient, Jesus is kind, he does not envy, he does not boast, and he is not proud, he is, does not dishonor, or dishonor others. And, He's not self-seeking, he's not easily angered, and he keeps no records of wrong. Mm. He does not delight in evil, but he rejoices in the truth. He always protects, he always trusts, he always hopes, he always perseveres. He never fails. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that beautiful? Hang on a second. Ho, ho, ho. What was that thing I just gave you? I said, I, I said this. Many of us can try to identify with the characteristics of Christ without the responsibility of imitating the character of Christ. Go back and look at verse 4 again. Now take Jesus' name out and plug your name in. Um, Mark is patient. Mark is kind. He does not envy. He, Mark does not boast. He, he, does not, he is not proud. He does not dishonor others. He, Wow, hold on a second. Now all of a sudden. <laughs> mm, we, 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 we <laughs> if I speak in the tongue of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm a resounding gong and a clanging cymbal. Good Lord, have mercy. But Paul writes, love handles all things. The question is, are you loving the way Christ has commanded you to love? Hello.